Starting a flower farm can be overwhelming, and overwhelm can lead to burnout. At least it did for us. If such a thing is possible, I think we burned out every year. There were some years where we closed up the garden and studio in November and didn't return until spring. We needed several months break to actually want to pick up the tools again. It took us a few years to realize that there's things we can do during the season to help reduce the overwhelm and the burnout. So we want to share those things with you today. As you'll see pretty quickly, most of these things boil down to not having a good plan. We started root design with no business plan and not much rhyme or reason. Just the desire to hold pretty flowers in our hands and maybe make money off of them. To be honest, we probably saw one too many articles about this new kind of farmer called a flower farmer and our conclusion was, hey, we can grow flowers and sell them too. It's a big jump though from being a flower lover to having a successful flower business. Sometimes you do need to dive in before you have everything figured out. But when you're starting a business, you should at least have an idea of what you want to accomplish. We eventually came up with a five-year business plan and set achievable goals. Planning helped us to realize what wasn't working, even if that thing was weddings, the main income for our business at the time. We didn't make a good plan to sell our flowers until about four years into doing business as Root Design Company. We composted many flowers in those years just because we didn't have a plan to sell them. Because Root Design was our side hustle, Farmer's Market didn't work for us. We also lived in a very rural area, so the orders were sporadic at best. But instead of doing our research and finding new markets for our flowers that would work for us in our schedule, we let this slide and our frustration grew. A few years in, we decided to get creative about finding ways to sell our flowers and found out the part that we dreaded the most was actually fun. If something didn't work out, we chalked it up to research and moved on to the next option. We did well with taking weekly bouquets to grocery stores and then also having events like sip and snips and workshops at the farm. For more options on selling flowers, you can check out this video. We didn't plan our bouquets the first couple of years and as a result made some pretty sketchy ones. I distinctly remember sitting in the garden one afternoon with weeds and flowers everywhere, crying and feeling like the garden was more chaos than order, more ugliness than beauty. It felt like all the hard work we were pouring into our business wasn't translating into pretty bouquets. I knew something was wrong, but didn't quite know how to fix it. Once we figured out that we needed to carefully plan out our bouquets by season, some of the chaos left and our bouquets definitely got better. In Zone 5B, we had three distinct seasons to plan for, spring, summer, and fall. To have cohesive bouquets in each season, we had to plan well. We found that spring usually lacked filler flowers and greenery, so we made a plan to counter that. In early summer, we lacked larger focal flowers, so we started some plants indoors to have focal flowers sooner. We found that with just a little bit of planning, we could eliminate so much stress and so many ugly bouquets. In the beginning, we didn't know that we needed to time our crops. Our plan of action was just to plant everything in the spring and then watch the bounty roll in. And roll in it did. Before we knew it, we had so many flowers blooming at the same time that we didn't know what to do with all of them. We ended up tossing so many flowers. You know what's just as bad as not having enough flowers for your orders? Having too many flowers. Some of this is inevitable, but the goal should always be to grow only what you need. Goldilocks it. If you grow a lot of product that you can't sell, that's money, time, and morale down the drain. Eliminate crops that you have a hard time selling. Grow what is in demand. This will take years to fine tune, obviously, but keep notes and plan accordingly. Now this ties into knowing what your selling plan is, because if you've got a set number of bouquets to sell each week, you can reverse engineer it and plant only as many flowers as you need to fill those orders. In the early days, we didn't make spring garden work a priority and had to play catch up for the rest of the season. We always have a short lull when things warm up in the spring to get our beds planted and mulched with compost before the weeds take over. Because of our early season neglect, we've dug pokeberry trees out of our peony bed and hauled so many wheelbarrowfuls of weeds out of our garden in early summer. Attending to the weeds when they emerged in the spring would have been a much easier job than hauling them out in June when they were three foot tall. 
In the moment, it's all too easy to turn a blind eye to the trouble brewing. Our yearly to-do list was born from being chronically behind in the season. If you're interested in our to-do list, it's available as part of our cut flower gardening course. We are always a little behind, to be honest, but the overwhelm and burnout decreased when we gave ourselves garden assignments before the season started, and then just showed up and did them. Maybe it was edge the garden in May, trim the roses in April, dig the dahlias in October. Getting something onto a list is a great way to get it off your mind and reduce the overwhelm that leads to burnout. When we made expansions in our garden, we often forgot to figure in the extra work those expansions would make. Take the year we made nine new dahlia beds and ran out of energy and time to run the irrigation for those beds. It was a hot, dry summer, and we spent hours watering those dahlias by hand. Several years we bought in stock plugs for our garden, but stock flowers are a quick and done crop, and both times they came on just as we were getting all the warm season annuals planted. Let's just say most of them died in the garden. Things got a lot easier when we were honest with ourselves about what we could handle as a side hustle. No, we couldn't do farmer's markets or weddings. Yes, we could supply grocery stores and have on-farm events. And until we had a spring CSA, stock could just wait. We're pros at ignoring the garden for a week at a time. If we worked hard on the garden on Saturday, we would probably give it a wide berth the next week. I mean, sometimes it was for our sanity. The garden can feel like a taskmaster, but we weren't doing ourselves any favors by staying away from the garden for long periods of time. When we made ourselves go out in the evening and just do a few tasks, we were amazed at how growing a large cut flower garden was broken down into manageable bites. Gardening at golden hour became a sort of refuge, a way to wind down after a hard day. We found we could trick ourselves by saying we'd go weed or work for just half an hour. That half hour would turn into two hours and we'd end up working until dark. Eventually we realized that the more we were in our garden, tending to it, the more we wanted to be there. The work became part of the fun. We might have made it sound like burnout is a thing of the past for us, but that isn't quite true. We've already dealt with burnout this year and we've had to be humble and ask for help. As we are starting over, these are the things that we whisper to ourselves, and maybe you can whisper them to yourself too. Rome wasn't built in a day. Give yourself grace.